You're good to go. Uh, and I'm uh, calling the Finance Committee meeting of September 29, 2021, daughter at 6.30 p.m. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this meeting it will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. And uh, instructions um, are available on the posted agenda on the website. I'm not going to go further because there is no one in the audience at the moment. Um, and we're I, are we, I, are the Samrus Media is covering? No, they're not. Okay. So um, under that circumstance, what I would do want to do, however, is first um, ask each member of the committee if they can hear and just by responding, let me know. And then uh, I'm going to turn to Sean and ask which agenda item that he's recommending, or Paul, which agenda item he's recommending first. Um, so going through the uh, members of the committee, um, Pat Angelus. Present, and I can hear. Uh, Dorothy Pam. Present. Lynn Griesmer. Present. Bob Hegner. Here. Uh, Bernie Kubiak. Present. And Kathy Shane. Here. So I think that we have all current members of the committee present uh, with one, of course, vacancy as uh, the present. So, but all, all seated members are here. And uh, so uh, the question that I wanted to ask uh, was whether in order to um, if Sonia is only here to present the third uh, or the fourth quarter and year end budget report, um, is the preference um, that we uh, start with that item? I'm here for the whole meeting, so that's fine. I probably would suggest that Sean start in case he gets called out of the room. Okay. <laughs> 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 Always possible, I guess, under the circumstances. Uh, so then uh, let's turn to the review of the draft of the um, financial management policies and objectives. And uh, my recommendation is that um, since the bulk of the comments were about sections um, fairly near the beginning that we just take it in order uh, because the comments are presented in order and obviously then um, it's easiest to do if that is that acceptable. Yes. If so, uh, then uh, how would we like to do this? Is, is there a request that, um, the, I, the, that the policy be put on the screen or the comments be put on the screen? Or should we just assume that it's all available to us? I was thinking, Andy, it might be easiest to go through it if I pull up that sheet I sent everybody and we just That's go through fine. the comments and then we can, um, you know, I can kind of highlight, unhighlight them as we address them. And then if there's anything that needs follow up, I can make notes right there. Okay, then go for it. <clears throat> And I will try and keep an eye on hands raised at all times as we go through. So Andy, do you want me just to walk through um, the comments? Uh, yes. Uh, and then whoever made them. Kind of if there in. were questions that had responses, you can just um, handle it that way. And if it needs discussion, then we'll get to discussion. Okay. But we're starting with uh, the overview and the objectives, I believe. And I see Kathy has her um, her hand up. Just, just a quick question. Yes. On the very front page, Sean, it says November 2020. Did you mean it to be November 2021? Is that what we're doing? Um, so just... 
So they were drafted for November 2020, but um, we will uh, once we do this and finalize, I'll update that date. But they were that's why it was 2020 originally was because they were ready last year. I wasn't sure of the timing of when we would um, discuss. Well, okay, them. that's I didn't understand why I was seeing that date and then I'm seeing them. I think for the first time now, right? Okay. Right. Yep. Okay. Proceed. Sorry. So these first two comments um, are both about a section in the old policy that was sort of like an overview introduction to the policy manual. Some of that got left out of this version, but I think both these comments make sense. So I think we'll add we'll add some little uh, either an intro or add these to the objectives. I think both of these comments were about adding um, an objective around financial and environmental sustainability, and then also about um, equitable provision of services. And so I think, um, and then the social justice impacts as well. So I think both of those make sense to add to the objective section. Um, so unless we want to discuss it, I would just unhighlight those and say that we'll add that. Uh, Lynn, I see your hand up. I, I don't mind highlighting these two, but I would just assume in this area, we say something about consistent with the town manager performance goals established by the council because in fact, they all have to relate to that. Actually, I, I sort of had the opposite view and I wanted to uh, just point out that um, this is a policy that has to do with how we manage finances and not what our underlying policies are that are going to be revised for year to year. Um, and I, so I'm, trying to in my head sort out what belongs in this policy that gets revised uh, you know every five years or so and what belongs in either the performance goals or in the uh, annual budget guidelines and i guess andy what i'm it, let me take that and suggest that instead of mentioning these two, I would just refer in general to whatever the current town manager goals are and not get into what they are because they change over time. But then there's a referral to the fact that it would be consistent with those. Otherwise, I would not signal out signal ones because the moment I see these, then I want to throw, you know, four other ones in there. Dorothy? I, I understand what Lynn is saying, but I think that we've made it clear that these are two of our major goals. And these goals are not things that should be on one year and off with another council. Um, I think they're just consistent with the town of Amherst. So I think I referenced the town manager's goals, but I think these should be, you know, for others, take a look at the, you know, list these two and then say for other um, objectives, major objectives, look at the town manager's goals. But I think they're important. Pat? You're muted. I'm muted. I'm not adding anything new. I just wanted to uh, affirm what Dorothy said, and I agree with uh, putting these two goals in here around uh, environmental and sustainability and also uh, social equity and social justice because they are going to be ongoing. They're not going to change. <clears throat> And uh, I guess then I have one follow-up question with the uh, environmental goals. We certainly have a policy that we've established and intended to be a long-standing policy and it was worded as such. Uh, and I assume that uh, the consensus is seeming that they both fall under that rubric. Kathy? Um, I think Bob's hand was up before mine, but um, no, okay. So I just, I guess I would, this is a financial, the title of this document is financial management policies. Um, so on the second one, I would shorten it 
to get off and leadership in all policies to incorporate sustainability and environmental stewardship um, in financial policies, but it's not in all policies. So just to anchor it in financial and later when we get to the capital side, I'll give an, ex I give an example that if we invest, if we, one of the criteria we use for capital investments is something that will lower long-term operating costs or have minimized the impact on the environment. It could be a criteria for capital. So I'm just trying to anchor it to the financial side. So the leadership in all policy seems to go to broadly. Um, and I have no idea how to do a same, similar kind of thing in the wording on number the first one, but I just thought the second one um, went beyond a financial policy. And, and Kathy, just on those, I think, you know, we'll, we'll write these probably a little differently, um, but maybe we can reference it like in regards to financial planning as we go forward, we can, um, we can incorporate both of these two objectives in regards to financial planning. So I, I don't think we, have, we don't think it's stuck on the exact wording. We can rewrite it so that it makes sense. Okay, and I'm just, and the reason I'm raising those is when I look at the ones that currently exist, everything is narrowly anchored in financial policy. You know, so just think of the wording so it's not, I don't disagree with these are central, but it's, this is the financial policy guideline. So I'm lowering my hand, I'm done. Bob. Yeah, I just wanted to, <clears throat> emphasize that we also need to consider financial sustainability. And I think we've talked about this in committee. So I, I don't wanna lose that you know, with the environmental, which is important, uh, but I think financial su sustainability is equally important. Okay. Um, and you can capture that, yeah. John. Yeah, that's that's in here, but we can um, if that's not already an objective, we can um, we can make sure that's uh, mentioned or highlighted. Dorothy has her hand up as well. Uh, an objective is not a promise. An objective is a goal. And the reason that I think they should stay in is that we do have ups and downs and we have hard times and sometimes we have to make choices we don't like. But we also I know that just from you know having lived this long that these are the kind of things that get dropped first. People say, oh, it's really hard. We can't afford to do that. Well, maybe you can't afford to do all that you wanted. But for example, we have said that we were going to put aside money for the reparations fund. Uh, if the finances got really bad, I think we should still put some aside, but it might be a smaller amount. I think the goal should still continue, although we have to bow to reality. So that's, I, because all these nice things, they always get dropped. Like in education, all the new programs, as soon as it's a hard time, all the new programs are out. Well, I just want to uh, want us to be able to move on, but um, the key question is in what is the budget that's going to be developed and um, submitted to the council, and what is the council then going to approve or not approve? Because that's what the charter dictates as the process. And um, these are kind of directions uh, or, or guidance to the manager in proposing an annual budget as opposed to a management tool. And I think that's where some of us are kind of going back and forth a little bit of uncertainty as to how they relate. Um, and I think, I think Andy, that's where we can, again, when we write these, we can write them so they're not, they don't feel as specific to one budget cycle, that they're more overarching. I think we, we can write them that way. Okay, so I think that uh, we need to look at the next draft and move on, uh, except that Lynn had her hand up. And if you have a set of goals and they change based on the priorities of the council and the whole set of goals are referenced here, then those goals also drive budget and they drive financial guidelines. This way you don't get into highlighting this here or that there or somebody else arguing, oh, it should say housing. 
those arguments take place when we're setting the goals for the town manager and then the budget follows. So it's that's where I'm coming from on this. It's not because I don't believe in these goals. So is that a suggestion that uh, they, we, they not be included or at least that we uh, look very carefully at what the language is? I think it means that we look very carefully at what the language is with an overall reference to the town manager's performance goals. Okay. Because my ending suggestion at the conclusion of this discussion, so now that we can move on, is that uh, we asked Sean to uh, send us a uh, marked up version that shows where changes are made uh, so that in the future meeting, we don't have to go back and look at the entire policy. We can only look to see what changes he's uh, incorporated and um, whether we recommend the, the changes as he has presented them. So, I agree with that. So I think that we can uh, go on and uh, the next one I... Uh, yeah, so the next one is on the audit. So there's nothing on accounting and then the auditing section. Um, I think it's referring to um, the length of the contract and how often we go out for a procurement of auditing services. Um, Dorothy, was this, I think this was your comment, right? Dorothy, you're muted, so we're not hearing you. Right, I'm sorry. This was just about more flexibility. It's, it's, this is not a major point, it's a minor point, but I thought the five years was awfully specific. Um, and we wanted to, you said these other words that are in caps. And I mean, it, we, you know, I'm unhappy that we don't seem to be able to change auditors, but you've explained why we can't. Um, so the next best thing is what you have set up, the rotating um, principle. So I just thought it, that should be in there. Because otherwise I would say we should say change auditors. You know, coziness okay. is not a good thing um, anywhere. Yeah, we'll take a look at that language and, um, and see if we can add something more specific around, the, around what you suggested. Thank you. Um, I don't know if Pat has any comments as chair of the audit. Yeah, I just wanted to say that the five years is a, a good duration. And we went through a competitive process uh, and made the, and it did come out that the firm we were using um, is, was scored higher. They were the better for, uh, firm. We had some negative uh, feedback uh, during reference checks. And uh, so I feel like, and, and the Melanson is also less expensive. And I think we've made a really good decision and that change of principle, um, it will be a very good thing because it really does bring different eyes to the process, Dorothy. Um, and I just randomly changing, there are only a couple of firms anyway in this area. So randomly changing the firm uh, isn't necessarily a, a productive thing to do. And I guess the other thing, Pat and I went to a training that was, that I think we forwarded information about to everybody else that was conducted by the Division of Local Services and the Office of Inspector General. And I think that it had a very specific five-year recommendation. Good. So should we go on to financial planning? Yeah, so I think this next comment, um, I don't, I think this was Bob's comment. I don't know, Bob, if you actually had any suggested changes. I think you were just noting that, um, you know, due to COVID, this is more difficult than it's been in the past. Well, yeah, I actually put the reasonable expectation in there rather than, what did it say? It said, without firm evidence that revenues, I just, we don't always have firm evidence. You know, sometimes we have to do a, a guesstimate. And I think COVID, you know, kind of demonstrated that, that we had to kind of come up with estimates of what we might get uh, in terms of revenues. So. 
I just I just wanted to make it a little bit more flexible. When I uh, read it, I highlighted um, the section that says uh, reven revenue deficits will be avoided at all costs. Um, I think that that's it's a good sentiment, except that uh, what can you do? How do you avoid revenue unless you uh, are going to lowball your estimates on and always end up coming out so that you'll always cut it out on the high side, which has its consequences too, because then you're always building more surplus. Yeah, I mean, you all, that's you always budget conservatively for that reason, and you know, not every every revenue category might be a little different in a given year, but if you budget conservatively, usually it sort of evens out. Um, but I think most finance managers will say that's why you budget conservatively because um, because of that reason, you don't ever want to have a revenue deficit. Sonia. Yeah, I just um, wanted to remind everybody that the DOR actually regulates our local receipts pretty heavily. So you have to have evidence to raising them and why you're raising them, whether it's rate change, you can reasonably expect money coming in. And they also um, look at if you put them too low. So they're watching that all the time. And I just wanted to point that out. You have to pretty much um, defend any local receipts that you put in the tax rate. Anything, anything else that people want to add here? Because otherwise it's the sentiment to just leave it. I think uh, unless Bob, you have another, it's anything else to say, yeah. we just leave it as is. Okay. I think that's what we're agreeing to then. So next. All right, so the next, the next comments on reserves. Um, and so the, the, one of the bigger changes in the policies is that we changed it from five to 15% to 10 to 25%. Um, and Sonia and I thought about it a lot, about what's that right upper limit. We thought about where we are now and also, um, having sort of a reason for the range, not that the range before didn't have a reason, but we really wanted to think like, you know, if we're at 10%, what does that get us? Is that sort of one year of, of a economic downturn um, or two years of an economic downturn? How much do we want is sort of that low end? And then at the high side, we wanted to think about why would we want this much money? What would we be saving for? Um, so we tried to write that in there. And, um, and I think the question here is, so there's a lot of questions on reserves, but the first question here is um, how does the 10 to 25% mesh with um, stabilization funds, which cannot exceed 10% of equalized valuation. So the 10 to 25% we're talking about are of general fund revenues, which is um, you know our, essentially our budget. Whereas this 10% of equalized valuation, that's the, the total assessed value of the town. So that's the number that's like in the billions when you add it all together. So we're nowhere close to, we're nowhere okay. close to that number. Okay. So that's that first one. And then I think the next the next comment was about um, uh, the, the policy talks about if we're going to pull money from the stabilization fund, having a plan to replenish the fund and whether, you know, whether we still want to plan for how to replenish the fund, if we are still within our, our acceptable range. Um, I think that's a good question. I think, you know, if we're, if we're at, 20% and we go down to 18%, I don't think we necessarily need a plan to, to get back to 20%, for example. Um, I think it's more about if we fall out of our range of reserves that we want to plan for how we're going to get back into our acceptable range. And I, I'll stop there because I see a couple hands up. Okay, uh, Dorothy. Um, this is just a psychological point. At we kind of feel that somehow we're in this big ordeal of four capital projects and that we're going to come out and we will have caught up. But the fact is we will not have caught up. Um, there are a lot of people are making noises about the senior center and um, that's going to be another big project that will come after we finish the ones that we've got on our plate. 
So, um, you know, keeping them on the high side if possible is good because we're, we're not really over the hump, even though it's going to kind of feel that way. And uh, Kathy? Um, yeah, I, yeah, this will seem to go in an opposite direction of Dorothy. Sean, you said we went from a range that was five to 15 to a range that was 10 to 25. Mm -hmm. My question is why, why wouldn't we wanna make the range five to 25 um, and then put wording in um, that would say, you know, we would normally wanna be much higher than five when we anticipate major capital projects. Um, but, you know, if we got, yes, we have a backlog right now, but um, I just want to see some evidence that 10% is something that we should aim to never be below is what, what this would say. And I think in my comments, it's like, what do other towns do? Are there municipal guidance that, um, uh, because it's 10% of general uh, revenues. I mean, this is a pretty high amount. So it's that's my question on if we were living with five to 15 and we were building it up, I can also understand why we want to make the range higher, you know, and then, and then do some kind of qualifying here. Um, I think you may have done it in your wording already, but if you were a lay person saying, oh, the town is got ever tighter operating budgets, but look, it's put 25% into its saving thing. It's just not spending money and the teacher got axed or the art program got cut in half, you know? So we need to, we need to be thinking of, you know, you build it up when you have certain things in front of you, but you don't necessarily need to go that high. And so my question was on, do we need to have 10 be the minimum? It, it, that's a long-winded way of saying it, but I also wanted more words that gave my the sense of what I did, did that we would not want to be anywhere near five if we have, you know, a backlog that we're trying to save money for, you know, like normal people save money to buy, buy a house, um, you know, so, but 25% but as a possible normal range seems high. So it's, I think I've said enough to get my, uh, sense because this, um, yeah. So, yeah, so I'm going to point out in, one thing. In, sorry, go ahead, Andy. Point out one thing and then um, go, I guess, Sean and then to the other two people who've raised hands. Uh, I sent a link um, earlier in the afternoon to a document that I recalled being there and did some searching to find it. Yeah. Um, because the for me the guidance in looking at the section is the experience and um i would be the only one who can say that i was on the finance committee at the time of the last uh, recession in 2008 essentially was when it was really hitting us and so we did a lot of thinking about the subject and that's at that subject of the 2000 eight memo was and so I have to go back and look at the experience and the question of how long we expected it to last and how long you stretch it and then go back and think about the 10%. So I'm not gonna express any conclusions out of that, but um, I did wanna say that uh, uh, with the addition of Doug Slaughter, who is also on the finance committee at the same time, I think we're probably the only two who are in some way involved in the government processes right now who were in Amherst and doing this stuff back then. Um, Bernie. Oh, did, Sean, you were saying to see if you had anything to add. I'll just quickly say um, two things. One, um, I think, Andy, what you just said is, is sort of what we did when we looked at this range. We looked at the, our historical revenue charts and we looked at the years where we had a recession and the amount that revenues dropped. And so we tried to set the lower percentage at what it would take to cover us for two or three years of a revenue decline. Um, thinking that, you know, that's a relatively safe time span. So we looked at, I think it was 2010 or 2009, how much revenues dropped then. There was another time span where revenues dropped. And so we 
And we looked at how much it dropped from one year to the next and how long it lasted. And we tried to set a, a number, a lower range number that would um, allow us to sort of weather that storm. Um, at 5% of our budget, we're talking about four or $5 million, million as a reserve, which just felt like at where we are now that that's maybe too low. Um, you know, on an $85 million budget. I think with, with COVID, we were sort of, you know, we were worried worst case scenario that state aid would be cut. And if it was cut, we would, you know, we would have easily went through that $5 million lower end in one year if that's where we were. Um, so I think that's why we raised it. We just felt that was a little too low and that 10% would, you know, kind of allow us to get through two or three years of a downturn. I just have to say, I think that's really a good, a helpful explanation, Sean. And maybe put one sentence in there that that was the rationale for the minimum. Are you know, we, it, it really yeah. short, but it, it's that that it could weather two years of a recession, you know. Um, thanks. Uh, Bernie. Yeah, um, the five to 15% is, the, uh, as I recall, it is the old uh, or one-time DOR recommendation for reserve funds and towns are all over the place. Um, I always tried to keep Deerfield's reserves at 25% because 5%, 10% is a dangerously low number. <clears throat> the other thing that people need to realize, I, I don't know if there's a way to get this across, is these reserves get built up from one-time only money. This is not something that repeats itself. Uh, you run a surplus, you put the money into reserves. So it's it's not like it's uh, <clears throat> it's it's not like it's something that's going to uh, uh, reoccur from year to year to year, or could be used for something like salaries. Um, I I think the ten to twenty five percent target is perfectly reasonable, and I, I I like the idea of just adding a little bit of rationale to it um, uh, that Kathy suggested. I think that would would make it work. Lynn? I appreciate that you and Doug were on the um, finance committee. I was on the committee that wanted to build buildings and got stopped smack in the middle of it all. Um, I, I wanna say two things. First of all, I absolutely feel that we should go with the low, the not a lower, but the 10% uh, for a couple of reasons. Different organizations use different measures for how many reserve, how much reserves they need to have. And some of them say, well, it should be enough to carry us for half a year. Some of it say for three months. You know, I think the fact that you've looked at how our money has fluctuated through periods of up and down of state funding is a good thing. And I like referring to that. But the other thing I wanna just suggest is we're never gonna be done with our capital projects because the moment we finish one, we're gonna need something else. And so we may feel like we have a backlog now but you know we have declining roofs. We have buildings. We're going to have to do things to. So, I I feel we need to stay with the ten to twenty five. Yeah, I'm totally convinced, and especially the two to three years. I just wanted a rationale since we were going up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Sean, uh, uh, later in the document, I think you had the things that I had added as comments. Yeah, you're the you're the magenta. Which color? So these are your comments, Andy, right here on the screen. Or these are so, from the sorry, these are from the memo actually that you sent out. Yeah, well, it was not a memo. Um, I think there was some things that I said this morning that are in that purple piece. There. Sorry, yeah, the top the top part is are your comments, yeah. Yeah, the top part of the comments and the bottom part is the from the memo. It's quotes from the memo. The um, what had happened historically was that we had stuck with fifteen percent as the high up until the point when we started looking down at the effect of the four projects and tried to figure out the four projects. And Sandy Pooler had come up with the feeling that we really needed to start thinking about it 
before we got into the projects per se and start building up the 25 because he, um, of the reasons that we now know about from Sean's modeling and which is really built on Sandy's modeling, initial modeling. And um, so the, the idea of running it up to 25%, Sandy had actually wanted to um, have the additional amount put into a, a new stabilization fund um, for capital. And town meeting essentially said, um, but we don't see why that's necessary because you can just do it through the current stabilization fund. So we're not, we don't want to vote. And they turned down the proposal to vote to create a new stabilization fund, but no, they were not objecting to the increase. So I think Sandy just took it off as a win and went on with life um, as we all did. And, uh, but that's the history. But so the question of going above 15% and saying that uh, you're going to replace it, uh, which was sort of the intimation of the whole thing, um, sort of is that, does that make sense under those circumstances and looking at why we got up to 25%? Um, so I just wanted to put that out there for um, general comment from the committee, which is why I cited that experience um, from the, how we got it to as high as we did. And the other thing here, Andy, that I liked from your, the document you sent out are the sort of three, um, the three situations when we might use reserves. Um, and so I was thinking, that we will look, we'll take another look at this section and think about how maybe we can incorporate something like that. Yeah, um, I, I put that out there for historical purposes. Of course, that was created at a, at a, at a time when we needed to be very clear with people developing budgets um, as to how the finance committee was looking at it in the time of uh, that it was written, which was the time of the recession. But, so, uh, so the next section, um, more on what we were talking about. So the, um, I won't bug you now with it, but there are a lot of, um, there's a lot of nice reporting online now where you can look at the reserves of other towns and see what percentages they're at, um, both their free cash as a percentage of their, of their budget and their, um, their stabilization fund as a percentage of their budget. So, um, the, you know, depending who you want to compare us to, there are the towns like Bernie said they range all over the place. But there's some towns that are in the 30% range. There's some that are are much lower. So, um, we can definitely look at any town that anybody wants to. Paul. So rather than just pick random towns, we do have a cohort of towns that we compare ourselves to um, for at the, during the financial indicators project mm -hmm. that we could use that as our benchmarks just so people don't start cherry picking towns. We already have some that we've settled on that we've been using for a decade probably. Yeah, that's already a, you're, that's a good point. That's already a slide that we'll, we'll share the indicators. That's one of the slides that we look at. So it'll have the our near our neighbors nearby and then some of the Eastern mass communities that we compare ourselves to. So the consensus seems to be that we're going to stick with the 10 to 25% that Sean is drafting language to explain um, a little bit more clearly uh, how we got to the um, those numbers, how and uh, what the uh, and, and something about comparables, but uh, I think as he's indicated, that's uh, also going to be in the uh, annual financial trends indicators report that we get in that meeting. Uh, and that you'll come back for us to look at the changes that you propose based after this conversation. Does that seem to everybody like a reasonable quick summary 
Okay, Sean, back to you. Um, so this is on the revenue section is the next section. So this first comment is about one-time revenues. Um, I think this might've been you, Bob, that had this comment or maybe it was Kathy, I'm not sure. Not mine. Kathy, was this um, your comment that, on the one? That, that is mine. And I had one just before that, um, Sean, just on, a, in, on, on the reserves, we have a, uh, we wouldn't we wouldn't use the uh, free cash um, in a down to an emergency in emergency. Do we ever define? It was a question of do we ever define emergency, um, and should we? So I, I don't want to belabor it right now, but that that question came up with the um, with the bridge when we first came on and people said, what constitutes an emergency? And is it, and if it's urgent to some people is an emergency. So I'm just wondering whether, you know, at the very end of this is, should you take a stab at certain terms were used, you know, what is free cash? What's an emergency? So it's a suggestion um, and I'm ready to move on. But I just, I thought, you know, there was actually, Andy, I think everyone was first, our first finance decision was whether to do this or not. And some thought we weren't in what constituted an emergency and others who were affected by the bridge felt it was emergency. So I, okay. I'll just leave, leave that as a thought on do we need something. Um, free cash is one that when people read it, they don't always know what free cash is compared to a stabilization fund, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we can look at, um, the state has language around what an emergency is when it comes to procurements and how you justify an emergency procurement. Um, okay. So there, we can look, you know, usually has to do deal with, um, with health and safety of people and also buildings and things like that. So we can, um, we can take a look at that and see if that would make sense to maybe add. Okay, so yes, yeah, so this on revenues, it was one time revenues will be used for capital or for reserves. Um, and when I was reading it to, um, or, you know, I get this last, or as legally restricted to a specific purpose, I think, and so I was asking as a question, I think that covers all these instances where we're getting one time revenue and we're not using it for capital. Is that? true that or for legal special purposes so we yeah we can, maybe that's something we, we can to use, maybe we, we can elaborate to use the, you know the covid money the arpa money i mean we can we could use it for operating so i was just reading that it either go is a capital purchase or reserve so um that so that was is that term broad enough to encompass all those um okay. yeah we'll add something to to clarify that and then, so that was my question on that. And then you had a second of fees that you're going to, fees and user charges should be reviewed annually in relation to the costs of providing the service. So here's one where you want to review a fee. Um, and I don't know whether we always review our fees annually. I liked reviewing them annually, but I'm thinking of the instance of parking permits, Sean, and I know you're looking at them. You might want to review them, not just to, compared to costs, but for a policy reason. For example, you're increasing the fee to park, get a parking permit on our street because you wanna contribute more to transportation fund because you wanna make them, uh, although the UMass lots are full right now, make people tw think twice about putting a car on the street versus putting it in a parking lot. Um, so this seemed to restrict the fee increase only to the cost of providing the service. So that's, and I understand you weren't thinking necessarily of parking permits. Yeah, um, and I think, I mean, I think this is meant to say as a matter of financial management, we should be looking at these every year and comparing them to, you know, to the cost of the service being provided. But I don't think it mean, I don't think it was intended to mean that we will never look at them for any, um, like for like you said, for policy reasons. So. Again, we can try to clarify that, um, but I think the it, was that it's, it might so be if compared to costs, or for for policy re or for other 
financial policy reasons or something. So just so you don't restrict it that the, and I don't know, I know the water fee is related to costs, the um, building permit fee is relating to the inspection costs, you know, so, so some of these have a much more direct link. So I like the annual review a lot. <laughs> And my question here was, if you are doing fees that are broader, do you as town staff just do this? Do you need to report it up? And this was a question, you know, before they go into, to, would you bring them to the finance committee normally, like we're about to revise our fees and here's the rationale? Um, or is this just something that the, we're delegating to the very capable town manager and finance staff? Um, so it was a question. So I think it, that depends on the fee. Um, so like the parking permit one, for example, is one I believe has to go to the, the council for consideration where there's some fees that don't because they're small enough or, um, you know, they're just, they're not required to. So I think it, and I think, you know, to the extent we would bring it to the finance committee, the council probably depends on the adjustment. If we were just making a very small adjustment yep. um, for something, I don't think that would rise to that level. But if it was something more, significant that you're going to hear about, um, then, then we would pr uh, probably want to make sure the finance committee is aware of that. Okay. You know, I just... you think of inspection services fees. Yeah, I, I certainly didn't think they should be regularly coming. So I was just, you know, I read this as limiting it to the cost. If you're saying you're not limited in your review to just the cost, um, I'm fine with it as it currently reads. I don't want to be labor. And Andy, I agree. I, I wouldn't want lots of small adjustments that are totally rational, uh, logical ra to becoming at all beyond the staff. Okay, um, Paul and then Dorothy. So, so there are two things. One is when you set a fee, it has to be tied to the cost of the service. You can't just randomly set fees. We're not a business. The fees have to be tied to the cost of providing the service. Uh, uh, so even suppose we had something that's really worth a lot, um, we can't overcharge for it if it's more than the cost of the service. Secondly, um, fees uh, are again are you know as Sean said are tied to uh, different fees are different things. Most fees are administrative and they would not go to the legislature for approval. They stay with the with the executive. Um, and what, it's not really about the value of the increase. It could be that we have a one dollar fee that we're going to quadruple. Um, to four dollars. That's just because it's it's not the value of the increase. It's really who has responsibility. So the public way is in the responsibility of the council. That's why you control the um, parking and everything that goes with the parking in in that in that realm. Is is my understanding? Okay. Thank you, Dorothy. Well, that was an interesting clarification because I put my hand up to completely second Kathy. So if you cannot raise the fees on parking on the street, then I think we have to find it because of the, what the word fee means and the definition of fee, that it has to be tied to service cost of services, then we have to call it something else because the complaints on this issue, the un injustice of it um, are just coming in. They haven't stopped three years of people complaining about the $25 year fee to park on the streets. And um, so if that's, if a fee cannot be raised, then, there, but call it yeah, something that can be. Just to clarify that, Dorothy, I didn't say fees could not be raised. They had so to be linked if, to the cost of the service. Yeah, but but parking fees have an enormous cost. Every all the police, the entire police department is involved with public. So I, you, you don't with parking fees. There's ample room yeah. for okay. that. That's, so that's don't worry about that piece of it. Yes. We can, you know, we because they are enterprise funds. We're not a business, but we do treat them sort of like a business. So we can think about our long-term capital costs and our need to have a, a reserve. And um, there's lots of things that we incorporate into the fee level when we set them. So, so I had a couple of things, um, unless you have more, Dorothy, since your hand is still up. Oh, no, thank you. Okay. I'm, I'm uh, good answers. In the section on um, revenues, I didn't... Uh, so they say anything about it in uh, written form back to you, Sean, but this first paragraph after the thing that's in green, uh, it, it, just because it's only uh, essentially a sentence, year-to-year uh, -year increase of actual revenue from property tax levy shall 
generally not exceed two and a half percent pursuant to the limitations of Proposition Two and a half, excluding the value gained through new construction, new growth, and expenditure increases outside the tax uh, limit cap ignores the possibility that the council could ask the voters to consider a general override and um, the voters could agree to it. So um, why have you excluded the override possibility and how you worded that? Um, so I think, I, I don't know, I, I don't have it in front of me because I'm sharing my screen, but I think it's that to say generally, I think it's, I think it was sort of implying that on a normal year to year basis, we're going to stick within that two and a half percent. But to your point, we can certainly add language that um, acknowledges the possibility of an override. Um, but I think in general, the, the policy is trying to say that we're going to live within our two and a half percent on an annual basis. Just seeing if there's anybody who has a reaction to. Andy, I read it. It says shall generally not. So I read it that the norm would be we wouldn't. But you're saying um, the implication if you read it that this would never, um, then it may need another sentence. But I said that our norm would be this behavior without some other action. But Which makes sense, Bob. Yeah, I, I was just uh, going to suggest that if you add in a clause at the beginning of that paragraph, something to the effect, and unless the, the 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 voters approve an override, dot dot dot, you know that 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 would say it's the general rule. But if there's an override, there's an override. Just a thought. Okay. Um... The next thing that I noted was that in several paragraphs down where it's uh, where we're talking about grants, this, um, there's the sentence that uh, said when positions are funded with grants, a portion of the grant funding shall be allocated to recover the cost of employee benefits if allowed by the granting agency. Um, I think that that's helpful sentence, so it's not really questioning it, but it prompted me to think about that a counselor who is not a member of the committee, but has a lot of experience in uh, town government, has um, on multiple occasions over multiple years, raised the point that we need to be very thoughtful about adding positions that are funded by grants because it creates community expectation or a employee union or some other expect group expectation that those um, positions will continue and uh, that we don't always have the ability to make that assurance uh, when we accept the grant. Uh, and we, you haven't really touched on that subject. And uh, you know, I can think of several times that that has happened where positions have come and then put pressure on the town to continue to fund the position or the position had to disappear even though there was a constituency that really wanted the position to continue. So I think, and, and again, we can clarify, I think that's sort of what the one-time revenue use um, being restricted to capital reserves was meant to, to cover, saying if it's, if it's not a revenue that's a reliable annual revenue, that it's gonna be um, targeted towards things that are one-time expenditures. Um, but to your point, we can, we're gonna add clarity around that, including grants as well, based on Kathy's comment. And I think that would address um, your point that you're making. Yeah, I mean, I can give a very specific example of one. Uh, now, is it, uh, this goes back um, a long time. Um, so Bernie and I may be the only two who can remember it. Uh, but uh, there was the grant program from the federal level that allowed 
municipalities to apply to for funds to add firefighters. And uh, we did uh, apply for those funds and add the firefighters. And then the question is, well, what happens when that grant runs out and the firefighters are employed? Uh, and uh, that was certainly one example. And the other one that I thought about was uh, the, the one that uh, the grant more recently that went, went to the Department of DPW regarding somebody to assist with recycling coordination. So it is a uh, issue that has recurred and uh, Pat? Yeah, I, um, I understand the issue and, and there we really would have to plan to maintain the positions after a grant. But it seems to me in the instance of the fire department where they've been told you can't apply for this seems to be not a constructive way of, of uh, looking at staffing and funding staffing. Um, it seems to me more likely that if you apply for a grant that will stop after two or three years, that as a, a person who's applying, you're also then looking to how you would um, fund on those ongoing positions. So I hear you and it's legitimate concern, absolutely. But I think that it's also the way it's been you responded to is to actually stop our uh, the department's ability to get funding. So I think we need to be able to look, always look and then see what we can do and what we can prepare for in advance. I, I don't know. So I hear you, but so I- maybe, Yeah, so maybe the thing for uh, to, to consider and John, you might just want to give some thought to it and then come back to us if you think it's appropriate. There's some language that if there's one time, um, if there's funding for positions, um, what criteria we might look at and whether we um, pursue the grant, um, and, but to recognize the concerns and also Pat's point. Seem to make sense. Yeah, it does to me. Thank you, Andy. That sounds good. Okay. Um, and the my last one that I wanted to hit on in that section is uh, where you talk about uh, strategic partnership agreement between the town and the university. Did you mean to exclude the colleges? Mm. Mm. Um, no, I mean, so, so a lot of the language I didn't change, I either updated or I um, modified, but I think to your point, we could add, um, I don't know if there was a strategic agreement at the time it was written with anybody other than the university, but we could certainly add the uh, colleges to it. Okay, Pat, your hand is up. I didn't know if it was left up I'm sorry, that was an accident. Okay. Then I'm going to turn it back to Sean to go on to take us to capital planning. All right. So I think these might have been Bob's comments. So the first one is around um, inventory. And I think the comment is... Um, is to, you know, we started really doing a, a more robust inventory last year and to keep building that out to include more and more of the um, of the assets of the town. And then, Bob, do you want to speak more to the deferred maintenance piece? I mean, I don't think that would necessarily be in the, I, I mean, maybe depending on how we, what categories we have for the assets, how we would um, capture deferred maintenance. Well, and, and, uh, yeah, I just wanted to, it, I think I'm echoing what Lynn had talked about earlier, which is, you know, when we're done with the capital projects, there's going to be more. And uh, based on what the superintendent of public works has said, there's a large, you know, backlog of water and sewer 
infrastructure that may need to be replaced at some point. I, I'm just saying that we need to, before we say that 10% is the right number, we need to understand what, what the inventory is. And mm -hmm. I know we're working on it and I, you know, I'm, we're not there yet and that's fine. I understand that, but I, I don't want to put some number in here until we have a sense of what it is we actually need. Um, you know, it may be the best estimate we have now, uh, but, but um, you know, I think we should revise that, that as we get more information. So, um, so the ten percent so on the water and sewer front. So those would be primarily funded out of enterprise funds, I believe. So this this ten percent is um, referring to the general fund. The operating budget and what percentage we would allocate within the operating budget and so generally that doesn't cover enter, um, water sewer transportation or um, or solid waste expenses so you know at the time the 10 percent was set it was a goal and we were well below it um, we're still below it so I, you know i sort of like it staying there as a goal to get to and then maintain that and then we can decide if you know if we want to go based on the, the inventory or the, the needs at the time, if we ever wanna go higher, we could go higher. But I think the 10% is a good number to stick to. And when we look at our, when we've done the modeling in the past and we look at what 10% gets us, it does sort of get us to a good place where we can start catching up on anything that's deferred and, and be more proactive on the capital side. Okay, that's fine, but I mean, I still think we need to we need to understand what the long term um, maintenance needs are, even if they're covered under different, you know, budgets. Um, it's all stuff that we have to pay for one way or the other. So that's all. Uh, that was all my point. That's yep, that makes sense. Okay. Um, you know, it's sort of on the same topic, but. You know, I, I've got a comment later on the CIP plan. You know, we have not traditionally, when that five-year plan comes out, had a section called enterprise funds. They're off in their own world. Um, and in this, when we read down, enterprise funds is asking for a substantial amount to be put, you know, to be reserved. So, Sean, there may be some way of making it clear right at the beginning we have two sets of capital needs. One is, you know, covers the school general operating, and then there are capital needs within our enterprise funds. And, mm -hmm. and you know, just, and that we'll first talk about one and then we'll talk about the other, you know, so I don't know quite how to do that, but, um, and then with Bob, you know, the 10%, you know, it's been a stretch goal and, we're about to stretch, really stretch to get back up to it, but we can see the pressure it's putting on operating budgets. So it, it, this, the sentence, I'm just looking at where Tim, maybe there's, you all don't, these are doc, Tom documents don't often use footnotes, but, but if there were a way of trying to just justify where 10% came from, you know, that 10%, um, We've been looking at it historically. This seems to be at a level that allows us to maintain buildings and buy equipment and also have some room for new debt. Um, and much lower, we don't, but, but this needs to be examined on an annual or every five years or something, you know, not to say that we know 10% is the right amount. So. Yeah, we can, we can add that. I, I think, you know, the, when the original 10% was um, that number was thrown out there. That's sort of what they said. And if, if that's not clear enough, yeah. we can, um, we can add language in the doc in the document. I don't think there's any magic number with a percentage, but I think when, when we've modeled out 10%, that does get us to a level, like I said, that allows us to be more proactive with capital. You know, as I said, I'm, I'm probably because I have, uh, you know, sometimes reading academic, I don't mind footnotes, you know, so rather than making the document ever longer that if it is is basically to tell you where did that number come from, um, rather than trying to write three sentences to explain it. So I leave that to your judgment on what this does. But um, yeah. So the, um, the next sec, the next comments are on the 
um, the capital priorities and there's the proposal to add a couple different, a couple more um, criteria for prioritizing capital. Um, the first one is reduction of carbon footprint of the town and then um, uh, adherence to long-term objectives of the town. I think both of them are, they both make sense. And if they weren't in there, they're, they're good ones to add because we, I think we already sort of do that internally when we look at capital projects that are submitted. So um, we should add them. Uh, if your hand is still up, I don't know. Uh, if you well, no. Yeah, I forgot to take it down, but um, I don't know whether it belongs here or I'm, I'll make a comment later on judgment. But um, do you think the criteria you have already say, I mean, it may be improvement, maintenance of productivity. Sometimes a capital expenditure is going to save you expenses later. Do you think the one you've got there already says that? <laughs> Um, again, I can't see the exact language because I'm sharing my screen and it's- I mean, I what it says is, is improvement slash maintenance of productivity. That's the only one I could see that would, you know, you've done capital, these other two things, but um, if I invest something now, I can lower my heating and cooling costs of the building. Um, and so it's not just carbon, but it's related to operating costs. So I don't, if, if you think the wording productivity, or maybe it's just improve maintenance of productivity or lower operating costs, you might just we can, we can, expand we can that. Add that, or, um, add that to an existing one. I think we can okay. get to, so it covers that. So the next comment is about, um, the SIP will be funded, funds of the town, grant funds from federal and state governments and other sources as available. Um, I think this was your comment, Dorothy. Dorothy, I'm not, um, I forget the context that this one, this comment was made, if it was just to add that quote. It's just to add that. Okay. Just to remind us that there's often money, if you, if you remember to go out and beat the bushes, mm -hmm. we should be able to take it. All right, and then the next comments are from Kathy. So this is around, do you wanna walk through these comments, Kathy? Sure, so I, I loved it that you said you're, gonna, you, you're doing an inventory, you're updating it annually, and you said, and you're gonna provide this to JCPC. Um, what, again, uh, and that you'll post it on a public page, a lot of people look for this, and we, because the report didn't attach it, you know, so just um, a commitment that you would post on a public page along, along with other budget documents or wherever, you know, so it's not just you have to see the packet for JCPC to find the inventory. So that was just purely a commitment to that. Um, and then the second is, it's a question, but we talk about that all the departments will go through this process. There's no mention that we have something called a resident capital request. And my suggestion would to be add um, that capital requests may also come from residents through resident capital requests. And um, one, so I'll just, one other comment. We made a recommendation from the Participatory Budget Commission that we think of when that open period proposal might come, um, that it comes at a time period potentially coordinated or near when CPA is open also, just so that if a proposal came in from a resident for capital and it fit with CPA, you could say it's a better fit with CPA or if it came in to CPA and it's a really good fit with a capital request, um, people could do it. So my, thing was mainly, could we mention resident capital requests as another thing that's considered in the capital? Going down my other list, this was a thought and this may be a council decision. You have the copy and paste of the charter who's on the JCPC and it says at a minimum. I've wondered for a while whether a resident non-voting member of finance might also be a member of JCPC to broaden the membership. And uh, Lynn's on 
it, as part of this committee, would that be something the, the council would have to raise if we wanted to do it? Because we dictate how many council members go on it. So it's kind of a question, but I'm thinking of, you know, people like Bob and Bernie and who have a lot of wealth of wealth of expertise, they don't get to be part of the capital discussions right. at all the way we're doing it. They just could be presented with a plan. So I was thinking of giving another link to the town's finances by saying to allow, and this is probably not the right place to raise it, but it occurred to me while reading through the membership of that. I guess I have to pause for just a second because uh, I don't have the charter in front of me, but doesn't the charter specify who's this the charter Remember, says the charter says at a minimum, Andy. Uh, okay. Sean did a nice job of copying and pasting the language. So the charter, I read the wordings as not exclusive. Like this is at a minimum. Um, it says uh, the JCPC shall be composed <laughs> of comma at a minimum comma representatives, and then it gives the list as we now have it. Okay, so let so me turn to Lynn. She, Lynn and Paula have hands up. So. Yeah, so that I know I'm raising different issues as I go, so I'll stop. Yeah. But you can take Paul first if you want. I mean, it, it, the way I, it is a charter issue and then it becomes a council issue. But it also is something because the committee is set up with the school committee and the trustees, I think it would have to be mutually agreed upon. I'll take his hand down. So. Yeah. Paul. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's really not clear in the charter that it, it looks like the town manager appoints the JCPC, but it doesn't. It, and it has the minimum representation um, from the three bodies. Um, so it could be essentially three people in essence. Um, but that's not how we've done it in the past. But there's no definition about what's the required composition of the committee, other than that there's three those three bodies have to be represented. But I have to ch study the charter a little bit deeper on that one. It's a good question, Kathy. And that's a committee that's advisory to the town manager under the, under the charter, so. Right. Lynn, do you have a comment still? No, then Pat? I just wanted to, to support the idea of having uh, um, non-voting resident member on the JCPC. I think it would be an excellent idea, give, especially given Bob and Bernie's experience. So I agree with Kathy and I'd like us to really look into that. Okay. So, so as I said, that's an issue outside of this document. So we'll, we'll figure out Lynn whether, when and how. So my, um, Priority list of deciding on capital on page nine. This this is kind of an overlap with um, objectives, but I it says greatest need, and I thought we could add some criteria potential for long term payback. Um, you know, which could be reducing operating costs, improved productivity, or reduced admissions, reliance on non renewable. So I thought it's the greatest need is not the only reason that we would wanna put something up with a high rank. Um, so it was a suggestion to add to this, uh, it appears on page nine. Um, mm -hmm. That's it. Okay. Um, Kathy, this final comment um, in red here, is there any? This is the seat that I raised this, Last year, Paul, um, JCPC, should or could we, I've seen a few towns that their capital report to the town has a section that's general and also has enterprise funds so that one can see capital expenditures across the body of the municipality and they differentiate it um, and ours doesn't. Um, so would we in this report said the CIP should be the capital plan with at least the five years and a separate section on enterprise funds. And I have no idea whether CPA should be in here or not, but on enterprise funds, I don't 
personally like to have to go to two separate documents to see planned. And if we had to do it on enterprise funds, maybe we would know that there's a plan to buy, to do a new well or to do a something three years from now, we'd see it in the, the annual report. So, so it so was we, a question about the content and the organization of that report. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a look at that, Kathy. I will say um, the, the capital plan is sort of complicated as it is with the different funding sources and uses. Um, when you look at that sort of first chart and it's sort of a full page of sources and uses right. and that's without the enterprise funds. Um, so again, that, we can look at it. I just, it, it's, it's pretty complicated as it is. And so. Um, and, and, and I would do it in the simplest way. It may be the capital plan has two major parts. The one is general capital that's all of section one and second is enterprise, you know, and that make it short. So it, it's just my, I like, you know, people know their centennial, but they'd have to see back in some other report where where that expense is and how much it is. Um, I just think it would be useful in something called the annual capital report to show the enterprise funds. That's my, and it, to me, it's a financial part of a financial management document to have it. Uh, so I raised it here. That's it. Yeah, I. I... Again, we'll be back into the question about where the CIP, which is brought up through the charter, where it fits into the charter. Uh, I think that's the one complicating factor. Uh, Bernie? Just really quickly to second uh, Kathy's suggestion, I like the idea of having uh, comprehensive documents and uh, pull every, pulls everything together in one place so that you get a, a good, broad idea of what's happening. Anybody you, have anything else? You can, you can ignore CPA, CPA, just forget that one. It, my focus was enterprise. Yeah, yeah I would just, um, as you look at it again, um, at least go back to the um, whole thing that the CIP really is specified in the charter and it's tied to the general, uh, to, to the operating budget that the council is approving uh, to make sure that there's, that it fits within the charter in some manner. But I think that's, you know, finding a way to get that information added to the report. Uh, is still a desire, it seems to be, that I'm hearing. Paul? So we, one of our goals has, to been, has been to put everything together. And Sean, Sean and Sonia have done a terrific job on our website of linking every almost every possible budget so that it's, it's all there. What you're saying is, you know, so if you, if you want to look at this regional school district budget, it's there. There's a link to it. Um, and the library budget, the more detailed than we put in a general budget. So. Um, so we should, we would like to look at how much additional work it is to put it into one new document. Um, but I think if our goal is to make sure that people can find all the information really easily on one page and then click and find it, I think that it, we shouldn't be thinking of it in terms of a book or a pamphlet or you know a, a production, but maybe that on one electronic sheet, everything you can find is right there so you can click on it and find it. Because I think the idea of assembling things into a new document might be a pretty big task. So, but that information should be all on our website. Um, and I know that over the last couple of years, we've really worked hard to say, let's make all those documents easy for people to find because it, it was harder to find previously. Anything else that's helpful? Anything else? John, we're gonna go on or? Yeah, so the next section is on debt management. And I think it's it's not really, um, it's more of a, a comment. I think, so it's about trying to maintain at least 50% of our outstanding principal to be paid off within 10 years. So, you know, not backloading a lot of debt so that we're paying a little upfront and then a lot in the future. 
Um, I think we, we want to keep that and I think, but I do appreciate sort of keeping flexibility. And I think, again, this is sort of a goal, um, you know, with the four building projects, this is a major challenge. Um, and, you know, it's a, it's a really big challenge if we take on, if we do four building projects to, to stay within this, this goal. Um, but I think we have a plan where we can, you know, stay as close to this as possible. But I appreciate again the flexibility because it is one of those things where we may not always be able to do this, um, but it's something we strive for. Uh, Dorothy has her hand up. Yeah, Dorothy. Yeah, just made me kind of wonder for a minute. Um, you know, I, I think most of us don't really have much of an idea of how much money may have come in from the federal government or the state in terms of COVID. And of course, we don't know how long it's going to last either. Um, but when you have extra or what seems to be extra, um, you know, I guess we've been thinking of reserves or free cash, which I, you know, I get confused as to what can go in which one, but also paying off debts. Are you allowed to do that? Um, with the grant money? Yeah. Um, no, not with... Um... I don't believe we're allowed to pay out. We're not allowed to add to reserves. And I don't believe we're allowed to pay off debt with the um, the American rescue money. There's a few things that are are specifically ineligible. And I think those things are because in, in the government's opinion, those aren't really the intent of what those funds were for. They were to address co you know, the, the health challenges of COVID and then spur economic development. Um, and those would sort of address things that happened in the past. Right. So thank you. That's a, but, but I think your point of when we do have one-time revenues, maybe not from the grant, but when we have other one-time revenues, one of the things we do consider is whether it makes sense to pay down some of our, our old debt. I think the problem is right now, it's sort of a good problem to have is we have really good interest rates on most of our debt. And so it's, it's always one of those things where there's not, you know, there's not one that sticks out like a sore thumb, you know, with a 7% interest rate where it's like, yeah, we should definitely pay that off. Um, so it's, it's a good problem, but yeah, we just, we don't have anything like that right now. So the next section is on enterprise funds and um, the comment again. So, so a little context to this. So the, the nice thing is there, again, we can look at our neighbor, uh, other communities as to what they have for reserve balances. Um, we brought the same sort of philosophy to this range as we did to the general fund range. This looks a lot higher, but, um, but the thing to remember is again, those, the, the budgets in enterprise funds are much lower. So, the, the budget for the water and sewer fund, for example, is four or $5 million a year. So um, 30 to 50% is somewhere between 1.5 million to 2 million for reserves. So it sounds high because of the percentage is much bigger, but when you think about the actual dollars um, and the, especially when you're talking about sewer and water, the equipment and the infrastructure that's involved, it's really, it's really not that much money when you think about all of what's included with the water fund and the sewer fund. Um, and so again, we looked at, you know, and we, had, we have more recent experience with this with COVID, you know, what would a downturn look like if the college would, you know, if the college and universities were closed, how much revenue would we lose? And would this be able to weather that storm? And so we, we sort of took that same philosophy uh, for the enterprise funds. And this was, and this is something just where there was no. This is a new um, piece to the policy manual. Before there was nothing around percentages for enterprise funds, and that was something that was asked for in the past. So we did spend a lot of time thinking about what would be a good percentage um, for for those funds. Uh, the red. Uh, I'll raise my hand. Sorry. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, the, the red, the questions are for me, Sean, you sort of answered where 30 to 50 came from. So I'm wondering on the 30 end, um, what we saw with water is when UMass went home, we couldn't cover fixed costs. So we were drawing off it. So is the 30% enough to cover fixed costs sort of, of reserves? Um, so that was, a, it was sort of a question, again, a ration, I like rationales of where we come up from 30 to 50. Um, and if we're um, building it up, I mean, if, if we're not facing um, a big expenditure and we're going along other than the anomaly of UMass going home, which was 
an unusual event. Um, 50 seems high to me. So I just, I just thought we should say a, a little bit more. Otherwise, it looks like people are building up cash cows somewhere and the town is just putting away money. So it's a perception. Um, so that was just a, again, I'm fine with footnotes that we, other towns are going this route. We know we've got long-term expenditure, you know, we've got some big expenses coming along. So that's what we're doing. Um, then my review of fee structure, at least once every five years, I didn't mean the fee level. I meant the conversation that we just had with Guilford that you could structure the water rates with a, a quarterly rate. Is it five, every five years, every 10 years? Um, should we commit to taking a look at what the way we, do you do a different commercial rate from, a, from residential? Do we do a specific, um, in the discussion we had for people who weren't there, we could create the large educational institutions as their own class. So it wouldn't hit apartment buildings and um, look, uh, affordable things. So would we want to commit to taking a look at it once every five years to say, rather than waiting for the department to have to say we need a change? So it's a question. I personally would like that commitment, but I don't know whether five years is the right time period. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't think it's a bad idea. I think, again, it's a staffing thing and, and having some, you know, what does that review entail? Um, but I don't think it's a bad idea to, again, for it to be a pol in the policy manual for something we strive for um, to take a look at it every five years. Okay. That was my comment. So I'll keep going. Um, so there was nothing with CPA or revolving funds. Um, and then we get to the investment policy. Um, there were a lot of comments on the investment policy. I'll be um, pretty blunt that the investment policy was put together you know, in large part by lawyers and you know, we're very careful about the investment policy and not making too many tweaks to that because um, you know, it's very, this is a very important policy with how the treasurer does her work and what's uh, compliant with state law um, and you know issues of fiduciary duty and things like that. So we don't want to make too many tweaks. And if we do, we would definitely run them by our um, legal counsel first. So we can, we'll go through these, but um, our, our investment policy is pretty consistent with many investment policies across the state, um, probably because they were all written by you know one or two attorneys at one point. So the um, first comments I believe were from Dorothy and it's about the prudent investor rule. Um, I think it was more of a comment, just Dorothy, you can add to that if you want, but I think you were just asking, you know, how is the prudent investor rule related to the investment policy? Yes, yes, that was the question. Okay, yeah, that's, I mean, that's something we can talk with our, um, both our attorney, but also our, um, we have an investment advisor that takes our investment policy and makes sure that we're compliant with it and, and he's mm -hmm. compliant with it. Um, so we can look at that more. Um, and then I think there were some comments around just fixing town meet, changing town meeting to town council, which those totally make sense. Those ones I missed. So, yep, those are good. Yes, they're still going to be sneaking around for a couple of years, I'm sure. But at some point, we'll get rid of them all. Yep. Um, this comment on ethics, I think, makes sense. Um, again, this is just broadening um, the behavior that we want out of the town treasurer and assistant treasurers to include anybody who may have any uh, role in implementing the investment policy. So I think that one makes sense. I don't see any major issues with that. Um, and that and that gets us to the next section. So yeah, any before you go into the next section, I'll let me ask uh, one question about investments and the the invest we control the investment of the OPEP trust and we have made the decision to invest that with this Commonwealth with, um, through what is it, Iraq or whatever it's called. Yeah. Um, but uh, the investments that are made of our other 
um, retiree money or pension money that's entirely in the hands of um, New Hampshire County retirement system and we are committed to the retirement system that can't be changed is do I have that correct right and I think I'll, I'll double check for the committee I believe I thought I heard something that Hampshire County also made a decision to um either transition to the state or to do something different going forward. But I will double check that for the committee because that would just make it simple if everything was invested with the state. Yeah, the reason that I bring it up just so that uh, everybody knows is that I was talking with somebody who's had some prior role in working with the town on various financial policies the other day. And uh, he was complaining that Hampshire County is underperforming the state on a consistent basis. Uh, yeah, I mean, we do get reports um, uh, quarterly, and I will say that they both are doing really well. They, I, I'll have to double check to see if they were underperforming. I know at points they were doing better, I thought, but, um, but they both have done very, very well in the past year, as you might expect with the way the stock market's gone. We've seen pretty pretty strong investment um, gains, um, which I think, you know, if you look at the audit, I think it's discussed in the audit too, because we have to add the, the investment gains to the different funds. So um, both places are doing pretty well, but we can get more information on that. Okay, now I'll talk to you about that some other time too. I don't think we need to deal with that in the policy right now further. So, uh, is anybody who wants uh, to say anything else, or otherwise, uh, Sean's going to go on to the next section on uh, asset management disposal? Okay, go ahead, Sean. So, yeah, the next section a lot of this is um, a lot of these comments, it, it is state law, so we don't have a lot of flexibility around it. Um, so, this first one. Um, I think was under the bid category of procurement. There's different categories based on the how much you're buying and the there's a couple methods that are available available to you at different amounts. Um, this particular section was under what we call a bid. And so with a bid, we don't have any choice. We have to go with the lowest um, responsible and responsive bidder. Um, we don't have, we can't make a, a a qualitative decision. Is If we deem that the vendor is responsible and responsive, which there's define there's clear definitions of what what those mean um then we have to go with the lowest bidder so so we don't really have much we can do there the next one so the next one is a comment that came from the a different section it came from the request for proposal section so um, when you purchase over fifty thousand dollars of of a supply or a service you can choose to do a bid which is you go with the lowest price um, or you can choose to go with a request for proposals process, which we do sometimes for different things. Um, and when you do a request for proposals in that particular procurement type, you can weigh cost versus quality. Um, so again, this, it, it sounds like it's contradicting the prior one, but there are two different sections. So um, okay. Okay. the, the different type of procurement dictates what you can do. Um, and Fair same enough. thing for the next comment. Uh, I sorry, I was I, I that confused me a little, but yeah, procurement is uh it's it is a um it's good. It, there's a lot of rules and helpful guidance on on the uh, state website, but um it can be a little confusing because you can do you have choices at different levels. Um, and then so the next comment, Kathy, I think these are your comments. Do you want to walk through these? Um, yeah, so I saw the liability policy that um, when you're doing a contract that you have a million dollars or 10% of the project construction costs as liability insurance. And it was a basic question, would this also apply to a state partially funded grant program. So thinking of the elementary school budget building project or the library project, um, uh, is this in general, is this across the board or is this specific to everything but those? Um, that was the question on this first one. And, and then Paul, I know this came up in the elementary school 
uh, bids for the designer, we had to fill out a thing on how much liability insurance they had to have. You know, did we have guidelines or not? So I just didn't know whether we, how we apply this. It was a question. Um, yeah, let me, let's, let me look at that one further. Um, yeah, for that, we were looking at the, um, the professional liability for a designer. Um, but let me look at this one more to see if we want to add anything or make sure that uh, it makes sense to us. And, and you know, if, 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 in, if this is not specific to those others, you could say, you know, except where it's funded and guided by grant principles or something, this is the policy. So, so like with Jones, um, the, you know, assuming everything goes ahead, do we have will they have to have a liability policy for 10% of the project construction costs? So it's, it, it was a question that I had. And I don't know how we currently do things. So I wasn't questioning the levels as much as what it applied to. Okay. And then my second piece is um, for design proposals, the procurement officer, the chief procurement officer, and I think you are that person for the time being. But anyway, the chief. Uh, Paul's, technically, Paul's technically the chief. Um, okay, you're the chief, chief Paul. So Paul appoints a committee. Um, I know again, with the grant driven ones, MSBA has a very specific what a committee has to be. Um, does, um, do we want to give any guidance that that in general, there should be, for others, there should be at least one person from department staff, or is this completely at the discretion of, um, in this case, Paul? That's, that was my question. And then Paul has his hand up, so maybe. Yeah, so mm -hmm. a few, thank you, Andy. So a few things on that. One is, uh, yeah, so there's, I want to differentiate, there's the chief procurement officer, then the certified public procurement official. Sean is the CPPO. Uh, I'm the chief procurement officer, the different roles, different responsibilities. Um, they can be one and the same, but they are different in our town. Um, so what I'm worried about is that our policies become so prescriptive and there are so many things changing, like the, a, a grant program may have one requirement, our insurance company may have a different requirement. And if we get to be very specific, and these, these are policies, um, and I know they're guidelines, but I think we, I don't want to get in a situation where we do something based on our insurance company saying you have to have this amount of insurance, uh, or, or the market says, you know, you, you, you're not going to get any bids if you have that level of insurance and we've become, and we're out of compliance with our financial policies because then we get into trouble because someone can go to a bid document and say, ha, huh, you didn't comply with your own rules and you've put it in writing. So when we get really prescriptive and detailed in these policies, um, I understand the purpose of it. I think it's good to say what our goals are, but, but to, you know, and I think, you know, for reserves and things like that, being specific is really good. But on some of the things, um, I just feel like sometimes we're getting too detailed in our policies um, uh, in terms of how we're doing our operations. And because there's a lot of different people who tell us how to do the operations, whether it's state law, it's a granting authority, uh, it's our insurance company, it's our legal advice. And, and so I just caution the finance committee about, as you make your recommendation about these, how I'm gonna look at these policies when we finally adopt them. And, and Paul, I just wanna say that I wasn't actually saying we should go beyond, I was sort of asking how broadly do we, do, I don't even know where the 1 million and 10% came from. So I'm assuming that works, um, but I saw that and I didn't know how broadly that applied. And now that I know you are the chief procurement officer under the charter, you always appoint committees. So I'm perfectly fine. <laughs> I wouldn't add detail to that. Um, so I'm, I'm fine with just ignore and, um, and, and I think it's understood that when we're doing a request for services that's grant supported, there's a whole there's a whole separate set that the granting authority apply that is our guideline. So I don't think we have to put that language in, but I was just thinking this the document is written as if we're building roads and we're building bridge, you know, it's it's completely um, we get into a very different world as I'm discovering when we're in the MSBA world where um, 
they get to rewrite our sentences in the RFS. It's not just content. Um, so, so we might not need this. I just, you know, it's like a disclaimer that this general policy, this is the general policy and there may, may indeed, and there will be other policies that pertain when it's, it's driven by grant. Um, so. Mm. That's it. I, okay, it, so uh, Dorothy, your hand is up. I just. It's, it's uh, if this is totally out of order, just tell me. Um, all of a sudden, I'm thinking that we've been talking about capital projects a lot, and no one's had men mentioned percent for art for a long time. I'm assuming that we did pass that and that we um, will, in fact, be budgeting uh, sums um, for that within certain limits, which I've kind of forgotten all the rules, but I know that we spent a lot of time trying to get them just right. So um, that money will it will be in the budget somehow. I mean, I don't quite know. Dorothy, that. if you have time, we can sit and I can pull up the um, the four building project capital tool. There's a little drop down for a percent for art. Oh, we can good. play around with that for this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, we, yeah, we are definitely, um, that's been incorporated. Um, I think when we built that, it wasn't a half percent. I think it's a half percent for art now, but um, but that's a good point. Well, that's definitely um, something we're building into the planning. Good, thank you. That is a bylaw, so it's got already teeth to it because it is a bylaw. Okay, so right. Sean, uh, we're almost done. Um, yeah, just to open up this. Yeah, so it actually wasn't under. So this comment was um, was Dorothy's, and I think it was. Um, potentially adding a new section to the financial policies about the creation of a popular annual annual financial report. Um, I don't think we necessarily need to add it to the um, to the policies, but I think this is sort of like what Paul was saying earlier. You know, there may be ways as we go forward where we can use technology to maybe put things together in a way that are real easy for people to to digest. Um, I looked at the example, I think it was Denver was the, the example that looked more comparable to maybe an Amherst in terms of um, our capacity and what we could do. Um, and that was a 20 page document that just kind of pulled things from different places and, and put it into an easy, um, easy to follow format. So again, that might be a goal that we strive for um, in the coming years, trying to maybe create like a condensed version of, of information. But um, I don't know if we would want to put in the policy manual at this point. I just, I just think few people, they want to know there's a report, but then when it comes down to it, few people are going to read it. But um, I mean, Bob showed me some examples of, yeah. um, you know, New York City, which, you know, it's a monstrous budget, actually has like a 20 page report. So it's really just more for our outreach. Mm -hmm. Lynn has her hand up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just want to mention that evidently some towns in uh, our cities in, in Massachusetts are doing this. We saw that as an option with one of our um, bidders for the audit uh, was to do that kind of a financial report, uh, but it's also costly. So I think we have to weigh um, the great goal, but it doesn't belong here. Okay, so is there anything else? Um, I just have a really minor one on OPEB. <laughs> okay, on OPEB, for lay people, could we or should we, other post-employment benefits or benefits other than pensions that the town promises? Just adding that, because I can't tell you how many times it's like, where, where are pensions? We're not talking, this is, OP, OPEB is not pensions. Um, so our benefits other than pensions, I would just add those words. So, so the word other means other than something. Um, that was just a simple for lay person. So now we're talking, we're basically talking about retiree health insurance and to the extent we do life insurance um, or dental or something other than pensions. That, that would, and it's not even a definition. It's so much, it's the sentence, other are benefits. And I'd add that clause 
are benefits other than pensions that the town promises. You know, so I was only going to add those words to that lead sentence, Sean. That's it. Pat? Yeah, I don't think that's needed because if you read further, the last sentence is an employee's pension is not included as that is paid by a shared retirement system. So the information is right there, Cass. I guess it is, Pat, but when you say other, don't you want to know what other than? I, I was going to make it even shorter. Are benefits other than, and I could delete that. Well, I that. think it gets explained. So oh, well, I guess I, I would delete. I didn't, have the I, same, I didn't have the same clause. I guess I would delete the third sentence and make it in the first, but I'm I'm fine. You know, the word says other, and it's, <laughs> so I'm yeah, fine. It's not it, a term it that's it's all only to say other than it's kind of other than pensions, but you are correct that the third sentence says pensions are not in this. <laughs> yeah, well, it, we, we did not create the term OPEB though, it was created by the much larger world and thrust upon us. Lynn? You can leave it the way it is. I just keep trying to explain what other i forgot to take okay. my hand down okay so um uh, sean I think we're... yeah kathy go ahead no no i'm trying to take my hand down it's down now okay i think we've gone through the document yeah can so I... I can i can do what you suggested andy i can do a track changes version to um to address a lot of the comments that were made and and i'll review it with paul first and we'll um and you know we'll send a final version of what we feel comfortable with, um, and then it's up to the committee. When again, this is more of a recommend, uh, you know, a recommendation type vote. Um, but we'll send back something in the next few weeks. Did we remember to tell you that you did a terrific job? Oh, th thank you. No, well, again, a lot of the a lot of the um, you know the nice thing about working for Amherst is a lot of things are already done. It's just updating them on a regular basis. So, um, so a lot of the wording, you know, I'm sure Andy helped, right? We just sort of looked at where there might be gaps and then um, and looked at some of our recent challenges and tried to um, update the document. But again, the framework for the, the policies were really strong and already existed. Uh, you and Sonia still do a good, really good job though. So don't diminish yeah. it. And just uh, to yeah. note, yeah, I just want to note that it's a team effort that Sonia looks you know, at all these well, things I, as well. I meant so. a, a bigger, it's the big, the big you, <laughs> the, the yay team. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, there, there is a lot of work in this. Um, I just would in, caution you again, and Paul, I think you're, you, you, you may well have said this, to be careful about the section around procurement, because if we get too far away from what the black letter of 30B, um, and, and things are always changing with procurement. So it, it might be best off to, to simplify, to, as you go back through it, look at where you could simplify that section or just incorporate by reference um, what the state regulations require. So that way you're not, you're, you're not drifting and you're not creating a, you're not creating a, a sequence or a policy that uh, runs afoul of the, the Commonwealth or the, uh, either its laws or regs. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Because otherwise we should move on to other agenda items. And I do know we have met one member of the public. And uh, I'm going to just leave it uh, right now that we don't have a specific time for scheduling public comment. Uh, but if the uh, one person who's in the attendance of the meeting uh, would like to make public comment, if you raise your hand, I will know that you raised your hand and then I will work public comment in at um, an appropriate time. But I, I think we want to go on um, and get the uh, fourth quarter report, year end report done, which actually is going to tie us back to some sections of the policy that we just talked about. Um, so that would be the next agenda item I would propose to bring in because I actually do see a link. So, Sonia, do you want to start us off or? Sonia appears frozen. Is it 
Is there, is there a connection problem? No, I, th I think she's just muted. Sonia, pull your little, um, your, your head set down. Yeah, I'm not used to headsets. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. All right. I would have been, I would have done better a couple hours ago on this, I think. Now I'm tired, so <laughs> forgive me now ahead of time. So we ended up the year doing really well, considering we started off 21 with a one month budget. We were so unsure where we were heading with this budget. And we were even considering a second month budget. And then in the end, we ended up with a $4.8 million surplus between um, excess revenues and excess and turn back of expenditures. I had this all planned out with bullets, but now I'm tired. <laughs> mm -hmm. So when I started to do this report, I was going to state that this is an outlier year, but then I realized the last three years are outlier liar years. So I decided to put this chart here so that on page one, which is a visual of the last six years between our budget, what we budgeted, what our revenue surplus was and what our expenditure um, surplus or deficit was. And you can see that from 2019, we returned our um, expenditure surplus was pretty large. And our revenue surplus was large in 2019, which is mainly due to the um, health insurance surcharge paying back uh, when we switched over from self-insured to fully assured. And in 2020, of course, COVID, we had the deficit. And in 2021, we ended up with a revenue surplus. And that's because we reduced our budget significantly for 2021 with um, COVID in mind. And we had a zero increase in operation in our operational budget. We reduced capital percentage and we reduced OPEB, which in turn, um, we reduced all the revenue estimates in our local receipts pretty drastically. But uh, recovery happened better than we expected. We had no budgets in, um, first of all, I'll tell you on page six is all the detail for the revenue surplus. So you can see that in a lot more detail, um, the rev how the revenues performed by category. We um, had zero, we reduced the local receipts budget significantly, but our revenue actuals actually came in a lot better than we expected, which was a great thing. And then our expenditure surplus was also very large. It was 2,047,000. And the bulk of that is from our employee benefits. We saved a lot of money under employee benefits because we had a lot of vacant positions and um, we had a premium holiday. So th that helped there. I have all these notes I'm trying to de decipher now because I had it for three different years. So on page on page uh, seven and eight, you can see the detail of the money that was turned turned back by um, functional area, and in general government we returned five hundred and fifty one thousand. And as I mentioned, it was a premium holiday in vacant positions, in our employee benefits was the uh, bulk of that, and and there was some. Um, deficits in the finance budgets because we had three major three major retirements in finance this year so there were payouts for that public safety 652,000 and that was due to the vacant positions in the police department and the fire department had lower operational expenses and overtime because calls had gone down in public works it was public works um, functional area work continued as normal for them. So there wasn't as much of a turn back and that was the same for planning, conservation and inspections. And in community services, we had turned back because we had turnover in the health department and veterans benefits that we paid out were less than budgeted. And it, that's been trending down over the last few years anyways. In our Amherst recreation expenditures were down significantly due to closed programs and turnover. 
The elementary school also turned back $658,000 from their operational savings. And that was mostly due to the shutdown for COVID. And if you have any specific questions for the school, I direct that to um, Doug Slaughter at the school, the finance director. And our, we had savings and debt because we, we bonded permanently this year. So we had some short-term interest savings and we had a deficit in assessments, which is normal. The state never gets the, the numbers accurately for those. And I'm gonna stop there with the uh, general fund. Do you want me to continue with the enterprise fund and just ask questions at the end or you're, does anybody have any questions on the, on the operating, on the general fund? This is my Just question. I, I would propose that we do the general funds and then all of the enterprise funds as a group second. Okay. So are there any questions that others have regarding the uh, general fund budget? Dorothy. I just want to say a word of encouragement to Sonia, who is tired. As you go through this, I knew what you were talking about. So oh, I've been thinking you. about over the past three years, all the teaching that you have done at our meetings. So you've done a great job and I thank appreciate you. it. So thank you. Um, looking on hands raised. Uh, the only, Kathy, why don't you go ahead because I'll so, say just, just one question, um, well, a question or statement. It looked to me like, the golf course is making money. Is that correct? It looked like revenues were up and we've been good on expenses or breaking even. So it was a question. Well, and then, and then the second one, Sonia, is UMass. We got nothing um, from this strategic payment. And I know the COVID payments were down. So it looked like there were two blanks, so it was we were down like two hundred and eighty thousand dollars. Is that correct? The way I'm reading them. Well, first I'll answer the golf course um, question. Yeah. We we cut the golf course budget. That was one of the um, okay. reductions for when we started uh, fiscal year twenty one. So the budget was less. Okay. On, and we also had no budget for revenues. We figured the golf course would be closed and no one would be using it, but that was wrong. A lot of people ended up going there. It was outdoors. It was getting people out of the house. So we ended up getting more revenue for that year. And on UMass strategic partnership agreement, um, that was, I don't think we have an, an agreement in place at the time right now. Uh, um, so there were, so there were payments made directly to the schools under the agreement. Right. That exists now. The schools get, um, I think it's two hundred thousand or so directly. Um, some goes to the elementary school and some goes to the region. So um, I believe they did make their payments to the schools. Um, and then the one thing I'll add on the golf course is that sort of a good news thing is that's one of the areas where staff sort of um, the staff whose jobs may have changed a little bit because of COVID, they chipped in and helped cover the golf course. So we were able to cut their the budget a little bit because we were able to backfill it. With other staff, so there were other people in the finance office and people in other offices, um, the senior center, um, who helped run the golf course. Um, so it did do well. COVID did a lot of weird things, and one of them was Cherry Hill. Cherry Hill did well um, last year. So, um, yeah. Well, it still had a ton of people out today. I was out walking on it, so I think we've got a probably because the other golf courses have closed. Um, we, we've got a, it attracts college students um, and families, uh, a big age mix and some women. Thanks. Okay. Move on to enterprise funds. Yeah, uh, before you do, because um, this is what I'm gonna, but I have, it's actually related to this, but the part of the budget we were just talking about it's more observations and wondering um, how we're going to frame the discussion of this because I can hear other members of the council asking these questions. One is about cannabis tax and um, whether the cannabis tax, even though we didn't have a budget because we didn't uh, budget an amount, uh, we uh, 
had no basis for creating a number, as I recall, was the reason. Um, now the question is going to arise about expenditure of it. Uh, second piece that then flows from it is what does this mean to what might be recommended to the reparations fund and when will um, you make a recommendation to us given the information that we've just received about the reparations fund. And I think the third thing that is a, that's a just a general comment again that comes back to the um, this, this particular part of the budget is that uh, in the end, if we do nothing else, then the, uh, the money, anything that ends up in free cash ends up in free cash. We're getting an indication it's going to be a fairly large amount and we can uh, transfer it all to um, some one or more of the um, funds, the stabilization funds, but um, we now have two and so get back to the issue that I raised before. So there's a whole bunch of policy issues that are gonna flow from how we deal with this. And I just wonder if you'd given thought as to the process to have this conversation. Sonia, do you mind if I start? No, go for it. So on the cannabis revenues, remember there's there's two streams. So there's the, the tax money and then there's the impact fee money. So the tax money wasn't budgeted in FY21, but it is budgeted in FY22 going forward. Um, so that's a category where there won't be a big surplus going forward because we are budgeting, budgeting that to support the general operating budget going forward. Um, the impact monies we are not budgeting, that does show up as a surplus. But remember, um, the impact monies can only be spent on certain things. And so Sonia's keeping a, a track record of every year, those impact monies and what falls to free cash and, and potentially transfer to stabilization. She's got a running um, tally of that. And so at some point, and you know, potentially this fall or spring, we've got to come together and think about how we're going to come up with a plan for how to use those impact funds. So those are in our reserves, but they have sort of uh, you know, a caveat attached to them that we have to use them in a certain way. Um, so again, that's part of that surplus that is sort of restricted. Um, and then the, uh, to your second two questions, the, you know, the plan we discussed a few months ago was when we do the free cash certification process and we do a transfer to stabilization, um, the plan is to transfer roughly $200,000 of this surplus would go into the reparation stabilization fund. Um, and then the rest would go into the general stabilization fund. But um, looking at this, um, looking at the surplus, we'll be able to make that $200,000 transfer as we discussed, I think it was back in June or July. So I think you answered all the questions. Yeah, I think, I think so. Is there any other comment? Uh, Lynn? So one of the one one of the anxious moments for people as we pass this present year's budget was the issue of funding the additional CRESS people um, responders, and I think as we look at what is it we want to do with these funds, we also need to be looking at where we stand with our present budget expenditures and. My suspicion is that we have ongoing unfilled positions. And so at this point, we're going to still have some money in the FY22 budget. Thank you, 22 budget that actually can cover the quote additional four positions for Crest. But as we look at our reserves, we should make sure that the FY22 budget has that money in it. Okay, that's my only comment. Yeah, that, that's a good point, Lynn. Um, we did get a grant, um, we do, or we do have a, a allocation from the state for those four additional responders. Um, but to your point, if there are any additional costs um, that we'd wanna keep that in mind. Move on to the enterprise funds. So on page five of the report. Go ahead. Sorry. 
So on page five of the report, our, I, I did another chart for the enterprise funds only to show, um, because of the ARPA funds and to show that we use some of those ARPA funds for revenue replacement. So the sewer fund, we had a revenue deficit of about 415,500, but um, returned expenditures of 223. So we had a net deficit of 192,418. We, we were able to cover that with revenue replacement funds from ARPA. So we ended up with a net zero deficit. On the water side, at this, at this point in time, we can't use revenue replacement for water in, for water fund. So we have a net deficit there of 420,000, which is the net deficit that will reduce the balance in retained earnings this year. And we have enough money in retains, retained earnings to cover it. We had 1.7 million as of June 30th. So, so it'll probably go down to about 1.4 million. for the end of this year. If we didn't have enough money in retained earnings, then we would have had to put that on the recap and raise it on the tax rate. And I just, just to let you know, that's how that works. Our solid waste fund, we did better than most years. We had a, a revenue surplus. We spend our, we expended the entire budget up to $5, actually $4.98 but we ended up with 40, almost 49,000 in revenue surplus, and that will add to the retained earnings in that balance. And I, in, uh, according to Guilford Mooring, people were using the landfill a lot more this year, probably because they were home cleaning their yards during, during the epidemic and the shutdown. Our transportation fund, we had a revenue de deficit of 327,000 in we were able to return expenditures of 48,006, which left us with a 278,600 deficit. And we covered that, we covered that with ARPA, we covered it with 288,686. And that extra 10,000 ended up happening because of a, an expenditure that we were able to back out after I had already done these entries, so. That's where we ended up with the enterprise funds. We did raise our rates for as of January, both in water and sewer. Sewer rates increased from 460 to 490 and water rates increased from 420 to 460. And we hope with the water rates, with the rates going up and the colleges back in session that um, our enterprise funds will do better this year. We'll be keeping an eye on it. And that's pretty much all I have on the enterprise funds. Is there any questions? I see Kathy has a question. Um, it's, it's, it's a question comment, Sonia. The use of the ARPA funds, are those basically the same as we saw in June where you said we, we, you were gonna use some of the ARPA funds specifically in these ways? Um, and as I'm remembering our policy, we, we said immediately use it, and then we were going to come back and look at ARPA for um, a piece. So I think if, as you use them, it might be good to, we're about to be in October, to think of doing some kind of report in November, or, you know, just in a one-pager poll, I'm not talking, you know, to this is the ARPA funds, this is what we've spent, this is how much we have. Um, would, would Monday be soon enough? No, oh, are you getting it on Monday, really? <laughs> oh, yeah, okay, so I've just, so that's exactly where I was going, Paul, that, that we are using it, but we're using it as we told you we were using it, and here's what we're gonna have. Great, that's perfect. It was really nice to see that you could get to zero deficit with ARPA, that, um, except for water, yeah. Thanks. Add into that real quick. Um, so the, the deficit numbers are a little better than what we were anticipating using ARPA funds for. So that was good. It was a little bit smaller of a deficit. However, as Sonia said, we're not sure if we can use ARPA for water yet. There's some weird rules um, around water. If we can use it for water, we'd like to. Um, but right now we've held off because we're not quite sure. Um, and then it'll, it'll be a month or so, but there's actually the, the reporting requirement for ARPA is once a year on October 31st. Um, this is the federal reporting requirement. Um, 
if, you know, if that produces a nice, easily understandable uh, summary, maybe that's something we could share out or post. We created an ARPA section on our finance page. Um, maybe that's something we could post once a year or periodically that shows how the funds are being spent. Um, in addition to other things that we'll do um, to communicate that. And, and Sean's making a presentation to the town council on Monday on ARPA. Just so you're okay. um, <clears throat> This could be a stupid question, but um, with the uh, Congress and the Senate um, playing um, Russian roulette with the um, uh, funding the country, are we expecting ARPA funds that are supposed to come, which might not come or would come late because of this budget drama? Um, we've already, I don't, I don't know if it would directly impact future money. We've already received um, the first part of money that's supposed to come to us, which was um, about $3 million or so. So we, we've already received some of it. Um, I think that's separate from that issue, but I, I could be wrong on that. Okay. Good question, Dorothy. Uh, anything else, Dorothy, or anyone else? Okay. So, is there anything last count opportunity to comment or ask questions about the uh, quarter year end report? And uh, if not, we will uh, send it along to the council as we normally do. Um, and of course, the council may have its own questions when it comes up, but um, it'll be a fairly brief commentary on what, what our discussion was. So at this point, I wanna get the public comments since we have one member of the public there. Uh, public comment um, can be on any matters that are in the jurisdiction of the Finance Committee. Residents are welcome to express their views under our policy. It's one to three minutes since there's only one person in the audience. I would certainly uh, say that three minutes is appropriate if the person wishes to offer comment and uh, that uh, the uh, committee will not engage in a dialogue about issues, but in the comments can be on. Um, any matter that is pertinent to the finance committee. So um, I'll just pause for a second to see if the member of the uh, public wants to raise her hand. And I think that the answer is yes. So um, could uh, whoever is managing the meeting bring her in and it has happened. So uh, please uh, state your name for the committee and uh, then uh, which you'd uh, like to offer in comments and welcome. Thanks. I felt a little awkward being the only one here and not saying anything. So I don't actually have any public comment, but hi everyone. I'm just here to learn. Thank you for doing all the great work you're doing. Appreciate it. Okay, well, thank you. I appreciate your being uh, attentive to the meeting. And uh, so uh, then uh, I think we can, go back to our own agenda of the evening. So just a second and I will get back to it. Uh, so I have another document on my screen at the moment. Um, but um, the, um, so we've covered um, the fourth quarter report. Um, so we're down to the next thing is uh, uh, what, Sean, do you want to um, say anything about the budget calendar that you've worked out and what you think are the needs for future meetings for this committee fitting in with the budget calendar process as you have um, developed it? Um, yeah. So. I'll, we'll send out a more detailed budget calendar at some point soon. We just have to finalize some of the dates, but the there will certainly be um, probably a meeting needed sometime in mid-November after the financial indicators report um, to start working on budget guidelines um, for and, and you know how that'll work this year with the um, with the council election. It might be a little bit. It'll be the first time we've done it, so just 
figuring out how we're going to go through that process. Um, so that's probably the next big meeting. Um, there are a couple of things on our radar that um, that we potentially would bring to a meeting like that. Some some expenditures that were unanticipated that we might bring forward, um, and we'll share more information. Nothing um, major, but just things that we might need to uh, talk with the finance committee about uh, going forward. Um, so I would think maybe potentially in October, if there's any follow-up, any special items that pop up, but definitely in November to start working on the budget guidelines. So we, uh, we would need to make sure that uh, the, um, all members of the uh, committee, including the resident members, are aware of the date for the financial trends meeting, which certainly uh, may be posted as a finance committee meeting in addition, just because we, we will have, so that their presence can be accounted for. Yeah, um, and I think the other thing I'll add, Paul mentioned Monday, it's not a finance committee meeting, but um, Monday night, there's gonna be a couple of topics that might be interesting to finance committee members. There's the ARPA discussion, and it's also the, um, the tax classification hearing where we talk, look at um, the different tax uh, implications for next year. So, um, so yeah, I think for the indicators report, um, Paul, I'm not sure if we've settled on a date. I know we were looking either the 8th of November or the 15th, but I'm not sure if we finalized a date for that meeting yet. I think, I think we said the 15th, Lynn. Um, we said that we're, well, right now in the ever shifting future agendas list, it looks like somebody's bad term paper. Um, it is the 15th and we would have the public forum on the budget that same night. And, um, but I also have my hand up to comment on two other items, okay. uh, two or three. Okay. Um, on the calendar for the council, um, I have budgeted or put in that we would do financial indicators and that this council would adopt them because the next council always has the right to revamp them. But to go to the next council with a blank slate, I think is really not doing them a good service. And as we may remember, when we were on the council and uh, making it up while we tried to fly the plane, um, we had a set of budget guidelines and it was really helpful. So I think this council uh, owes it to the next council to have a set of budget guidelines that comes before the council and is approved by December 21st, which is right now our last meeting. Uh, the other question that I have, um, however, is, and I'm certainly willing to listen to other logic on that, but I, um, right now I'm seeing it that way. Uh, the other question I have in that is, Paul, will there be uh, things in the presentation on Monday that need to be referred, on ARPA, that need to be referred to the finance committee that would cause us to have to meet before we start discussing guidelines? Sean, Paul? Uh, I don't think so. Again, the, the, the approach we're taking, and I think, is that Monday night we're going to present sort of initial thoughts on allocating ARPA funds, and then we are going to do some uh, public engagement sessions in October where we get feedback from the public on those allocations, and then we come back to the council in November with um, – you know, a, a revised plan that reflects any any uh, the feedback that we get. So I don't, I think because we have that public engagement piece built in, I don't think it needs to go to finance committee in between. Um, finance committee members are certainly welcome to in, uh, participate in those sessions. And if, you know, the finance committee felt it needed a, a, its own sort of uh, meeting to do that, we could certainly do that as well. Um, but I don't think it's gonna be necessary. I know it's not mandatory. We I know we met to accept the funds, I, and, but as far as I recall, that is the only action we have taken with regard to ARPA. And I didn't know whether there was anything required either in the charter 
our financial guidelines or the ARPA grant that requires additional votes. And if it does, then it seems to me that the Finance Committee will be asked by the council to advise them. I, yeah, we don't have to answer this today. Aware, uh, yeah, there's nothing I'm aware of right now, but if there if something does come up again, this is sort of a unique grant. And you know, this there was a ARPA meeting today and that question was asked several times by different communities. Um, I think we're on the right track where the council has accepted the grant um, and authorized the expenditure of the grant funds. So we're treating it like we treat other major grants. Um, but if there's anything that comes up along the way, um, we'll certainly adjust as needed. Okay. Kathy? Um, yeah. Those were my two comments. Just, that's all. I'm just building on Lynn's. Um, if Monday night, Paul, you're talking and you and Sean are talking about this, we did um, draft and then redraft and the council sought a general policy guidelines on how the two stages of ARPA money and thing. So we might want to put those in the council packet again for, for Monday night, just to say that we visited this once and trying to think about this. And now, and now you're coming back to us with the first, ex, first allocations as per, the, and what I can't remember is I know we spent a lot of time in finance and we looked at it and we all agreed on it. I don't remember whether the council had to vote on it or we, we just presented it as a document coming out of finance. Um, Lynn, I just don't remember. It was, um, yeah, it was just presented, but I think it does need to be in the packet. And I'm sure Athena's made note of that. Um, okay. The other thing Athena has reminded me, and that is I'm not clear that we have fully um, polled all of the members of the of um, that meet when we do the financial indicators, which is the Jones Library, the school committee, um, and the council. Um, and in polling, we initially were doing this on the 8th and we've now moved it to the 15th. And she's indicated to me that there is one person from Jones Library who evidently cannot make the 15th, but I think we need to make sure that all people have responded to the poll. The council will meet on the 15th regardless. So it, it, October 15th, we're talking about. Yes? No. November. November. November okay. 15th. Yeah, we don't do financial indicators till November. So then, and then, and we do public okay. forum about the budget either at the same time or very close to that time. So it just gives me a sense of how quickly we, we have to write our report if we want to get it voted yeah. on by December 21st. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, Got I was right. going to say that. Uh, yeah. that I'm going to have to go through and look at the um, our regular Tuesday schedules, which are the Tuesdays that are not CRC Tuesdays, and uh, make sure that we have every one of them listed and announced back to you in an email. Um, and so I will make sure that I get onto that really quickly and um, see if that's enough meetings to do what we have to do because I think in the past we've allotted two or three meetings to get uh, from the beginning process to the end with a final version because we do drafts and then we look at drafts. Right. So, I, and Andy, I we only at this point have um, two meetings scheduled in December. And so the council should be looking at a draft on December 6th so that we can adopt it on December 21st. And Sean, I just want to go back to the issue of um, in many ways, it would be better if we did the indicators on the 8th. I just need to know. I mean, it's really uh, Paul did ask me if we could move it to the 15th and on my scheduling. And we're trying to do the forum on a night of the council, not schedule yet another night for the council. Paul? Yeah, so um, 
so Mike Morris isn't available on the 8th. I think Sean Magato is uh, out of town mm -hmm. on the 8th. So that's why the 8th, we're looking at other dates. The council yeah. meets on both the 8th and the 15th. So, and I, and I know I, they're going to be, we're not going to get everybody for whatever date you choose. Right. I think we need to go with the 15th. Thank you. I think that we need to have the school superintendent of schools there. We need to have our finance director there. And we'll make a video and it'll be a regular meeting and whoever's missing is going to have to just watch it. It's usually only about an hour at the beginning of a meeting. Although some people wanted more time to discuss last time. So we'll stay with the 15th yeah. for financial for the financial indicators. And then going back to Andy, that that now gives you a sense of what we need to do as a finance committee. Yes, so I, I, I think best practice based upon prior experiences to not do a lot of polling about dates because there's too many people involved. Uh, by the time you put in all the different boards and committees, just announce a date as Lynn suggested. And uh, I think we've kind of identified what it is and go with it. And uh, at this point, that's the best we can do. Uh, it might be good to just generally announce it because there will be new counselors who will be counselors elect at that point, but not members of the council. And we want to make sure that um, whoever might be in that category is at least aware. So is there anything else uh, that we can talk about right now about scheduling of next meetings? Because there's and one I other think, topic. Yeah, but I do think that based on how difficult it was to schedule this meeting, uh, which included consulting Dorothy's teaching schedule and other commitments Pat has made, we probably need to see whether or not Tuesdays from two to four still work for people. Is there a problem with Tuesdays two to four? It's fine with me. I have to check how long um, my class goes. I think I will be able to do that in November, but not in October. I know I can't do it in about, October. Yeah, we're talking about really the pressure is going to be on once the financial indicators meeting takes yeah, place. Yeah, no, I know. Are you talking about Tuesday? Yes. Oh, okay. I'm. I apologize. I'm getting tired. Also, I can do Tuesdays from two to four, okay. or longer, which they usually go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I can do Tuesdays from two to maybe quarter of four. If if I leave a few minutes early, that would be okay. Well, that's a decision that you'll have to make. You'll have to see how the process runs. Um, but uh, the goal is that um, I will continue to work with the chair of CRC and make sure that we're on alternate alternating dates and that we are not duplicating dates in which CRC meets. And um, that's the, the process that we've sort of been working at right now. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, because I think Dorothy, you're the one who's on both committees presently, if I right. recall correctly. Yeah, just, um, I have a new pickup duty um, on Tuesdays, but, but I, I can, Maybe even make it if I stayed till four, but I couldn't stay a minute after, but it'd be better if I left a few minutes before it, that's all. Okay. Um, so covering that, then the one thing that's left is that, um, and Lynn might be the best person to explain this at this point. Uh, we had a decision at the last council meeting that um, allows each committee to make one of two choices about the um, future meetings for the remainder of the year, the calendar year, and that is uh, whether to continue to meet as virtual meetings or to do hybrid meetings. And um, so each committee was asked to um, make a decision as to how it wanted to proceed. Uh, 
I was therefore um, um, had been very prescient in putting in decide whether to continue meeting virtually if allowed by law and council policy. Just the way that the posted agenda reads for this meeting. So um, with that, we need to do it. And I um, uh, will just, I think that all of the council members of the committee heard the presentation about how hybrid meetings work. Um, if either Bob or Bernie need an explanation, um, and I, I think that um, we need to have you ask the question and uh, Lynn, who's really been the one who worked with Athena on it, um, can provide the answer, but otherwise we need to just come to a decision. So, Dorothy, your hand is up. Is it on this yeah, topic? I, it's that um, in my book, I had a lot of different dates in pencil with question marks. So, so I, I just want to know the date of the next meeting when the, or the next two meetings, if you have that. A lot of those dates were uh, because we had trouble scheduling this meeting. There are no meetings scheduled right now um, okay. going forward. We're trying to schedule it. And um, at this point, um, unless we... Oh decide we need to schedule one um, around something like ARPA that uh, really talking about um, trying to make sure we have plans for after November, but uh, let's concentrate on the question about- Okay, um, I, I did look at the ERC calendar and I know which ones are available. Uh, continue to uh, meet um, virtually or um, meet in person with a in the hybrid format, which means that uh, we're also doing um, at the same time allowing the public and presumably members of the committee to participate remotely if need be. So um, I just need, I think we need a decision out of the committee as to whether we want to just stay entirely remote. For the remain for the remainder of the year, and then we'll plan accordingly. I would like to stay remote till the end of the year. Uh, I think that's easier on staff. I'm not completely sure, so I wouldn't mind hear, hearing from Paul and Sean uh, and Sonia. But I, um, I'd like us to make the decision of meeting remotely. I think it works for the public and it works for us. So Sonia right. had to jump off to yeah. for family obligation. Um, I, we will do whatever the the committee wants to do. We, we, it, whichever you choose, we can accommodate. The way we've set it up, uh, it's actually to minimize staff demand, um, and to also allow counselors and the public to either attend remote or in person. If you, if you do attend in person, it will be masked in the town room. Um, I'm gonna recognize Kathy because her hand is up and I just uh, say that I would really welcome a uh, motion because <laughs> then we'll have something we can uh, deal with and be done with this meeting. Um, that, thanks to Andy. I was gonna make a motion to continue to meet um, by Zoom to the end of the year. And I know we don't have the dates yet, but there are a couple of days in November, including the 16th, where I'm gonna be in a meeting uh, around the school building project for an extended period of time. And that might make it hard to physically get down to town hall. So aside from other reasons, I think meeting Zoom, um, and I'd love to see everyone in person starting next year. <laughs> but, um, you know, the, the, just the one comment Make on the motion. <laughs> my motion is that we continue to meet. I'm just seconding Pat, but I'm, I make a motion that we continue to meet in Zoom, on Zoom, to, until the end of the year. Second, second. The Angeles. Okay. Um, any further discussion in? Because if I don't hear any discussion, if there's no request for discussion, no hands go up, then we're just going to go around the committee. 
and uh, the two members who are uh, president members can express how they, what their preference might be. Um, the members of the committee who are counselors um, should go ahead and vote and then uh, we'll see where we are. Um, so start with Dorothy. Um, I, I move that we stay remote till the end of the year. So, that is, so you're in favor of the motion? Yes, I am. Four. Yes. Okay. And uh, Lynn? Going to um, hold on for a minute and see what others want to do. Pat? I support, uh, yeah, I. <laughs> uh, Bob? Put the motion. You support the motion? Yes. Uh, Bernie? Despite the fact that John promised us free parking, I'll support the motion. <laughs> That's a different topic, but actually an important one for whenever we do come back. Uh, I will support the motion. Uh, and uh, Lynn? You didn't call on Kathy. Kathy? Yes. Yes, I. Then I'll make it unanimous. Thank you. Take in. <laughs> okay, so I think that we have it. There's no uh, unanticipated topics that I'm aware of. Does anybody have an unanticipated topic? And if not, then I think that we are adjourned. And I uh, thank you. It's been a very productive meeting. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thanks. Andy, thanks for, for, thanks for the hard, hard work. Next meeting. I, I really would like the date of the next meeting. I It's... I do have to plan ahead sometimes. And we, I, I wrote down the dates when CRC does not meet. And, there's, uh, and two of them are bad. Uh, do they meet on the 16th of November? No, 16th of November is good. It seems uh, to me like that's our first right. meeting. The day after the financial indicators. Yeah. Well, and we don't want to meet, I don't think, on, on the election day, November 2nd, nor do we really want to meet November 23rd, which is right next to Thanksgiving. So... That leaves October 19th and November 16th as good meetings when CRC does not meet. We are gonna have a problem with Thanksgiving and we are gonna to have to talk about that maybe by um, an email link and not try and do it now, but we are under a tremendous amount of pressure if, with, between November 15th and uh, December 6th um, ah, from okay. what Linda okay. said to, mm -hmm get a draft of uh, guidelines put together. Uh, I will work with Sean to try and uh, come up with something to make it as expeditious as possible. Right, so, so that's why then we really should reserve the 23rd if we can. That's the kind of planning I need to know because when I get asked by a child, what is happening on Thanksgiving? Are we, are we coming or going? It would say, it's not a good time to go, which I didn't say I wanted to go either. But, it, you know, Thanksgiving is something we need to plan around. So if you think we might really need to meet, that's something that we should be, we, we need to know. So and, uh, and, and do remember, we just said that we are going to continue to meet remotely. Right, right. Uh, even if you're out of town. Right. Uh, that's yeah. a lot it's easier. It's helpful. It's helpful. Okay. I appreciate that. Okay. Anything else? No. I guess for I guess we're adjourned. Yay, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. And thank you to our staff, Paul and uh, Sean. Thank you.